Welcome, everybody. I am John Haig. I am the co-director of the Mosava Romani Center for Business and Government. Um, we are incredibly fortunate today. We have an all-star cast uh, of um, uh, former senior fellows from the uh, from the Mosava Romani Center for Business and Government. And, and I got to tell you, it is an all-star cast. Um, and what I like about it in particular is that it's basically pretty bipartisan um, in terms of the backgrounds of the people that are here. We've got Camilla Cavendish, Sajid Javid, Paul Tucker, and Ed Balls uh, will help us moderate. And it, it's just a truly um, all-star cast. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like we're porting the uh, British government over to the Mosava Romani Center. Um, and if we could only do something similar for the United States, we might all be in better shape. Um, but with that, I really want to turn it over. The, the topic today is finding global Britain from political slogan to hard economic choices. Um, Barnab we're doing this in conjunction with the British caucus. So I want to turn it over to Barnaby just to give a few opening comments and then we'll get, a, uh, get to uh, Ed Balls to help really run the show on this. So thank you all for coming, by the way. Hi everyone, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Barnaby and I'm the co-chair of the British and Irish Caucus at Harvard. Um, we're very excited to be able to introduce this, um, I think the fifth in, in the series of these wonderful events. Um, we really do have a great panel tonight. We're very excited to see everyone speak. Um, and so I'd like to just introduce Ed Balls. Ed Balls is one of the uh, co-authors of the paper. He's one of our panel event discussioners tonight. Um, Ed was also former chancellor, as many of you will know, in the UK, as well as actually being my local MP up in West Yorkshire for 10 years as I grew up. Um, so it's a pleasure to introduce Ed and the rest of the panel. Uh, over to you, Ed. Ed, you're on mute. Ed, you're on mute. I apologize for that. Thank you very much indeed. Um... John, thank you to, to Barnaby. Thank you to everybody for coming along. First correction of the, um, of the evening, a former shadow chancellor, Barnaby. Unlike Sajid, never actually a former chancellor, but there we are. Um, there's a memoir in there somewhere, but thank you to um, all of you for coming along. This is actually the sixth paper we've done in this uh, series, looking at how um, Brexit and its aftermath will shape British economic policy. The last one of these we looked at the issue of the, um, the, e, the um, prospects for a UK-US free trade agreement, which we discussed um, almost a year ago, beginning of February. It was the weekend after um, the US had gone, uh, or Harvard had gone into international lockdown, and uh, I was unable to travel over. So everybody else was in um, a conference room in the Kennedy School, and I came onto this thing called Zoom to do discussant which I'd never ever done before and it was very strange but you know it seems a very very long time ago that um that passing of 12 months here we are now on um zoom and um we're going to um be doing um a discussion in three parts first of all um we're going to do a presentation of this sixth paper um finding global britain and i'm hoping that sechi is going to put the first slide up um now um, and then we're going to have a, um, a discussion. Um, as John said, we have three discussants. We have um, a former head of the Downing Street Policy Unit, Camilla Cavendish. We have a former Chancellor Exchequer, Sajid Javid, and a former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, Paul Tucker, who are all going to give us different perspectives on this, these issues as we go um, forward. And then we're going to open it up to um, discussion and um, the Q&A function on your screens will be where you can ask questions and we'll have a respond to those um, questions. And then um, we uh, um, will we'll end by 7.30. Um, the paper, um, just to introduce my co-authors who'll be here for the, for the evening, and Nasha Weinberg, Jessica Redmond, Sechi Kalassi, Tomasa Cariati. Um, Nasha is a graduate um, MPP of the Kennedy School. Uh, Jess, Sechi and Tomasa are still um, on programmes for MPP or MPA, um, MBA, uh, MPA. And we've been working on this paper over the last few, um, few, few weeks. The type of the paper, Sechi, um, next slide, is Finding Global Britain, political slogan to hard economic policy uh, choices. The thing which has motivated us here is thinking about how 
the aftermath of Brexit, but also the agreeing of um, the EU deal just at the turn of the year, how that now opens up the prospects for British economic policy going forward. The former Prime Minister, Theresa May, declared a few years back that Brexit will now make a truly global Britain possible. As Britain takes over the presidency this year of the G7 and also the COP26 talks, Boris Johnson tweeted at the start of the year, this will be a hugely important year for global Britain. Um, and the, the question we are going to ask in this presentation is what is this global Britain? What does it actually consist of and what are the choices which, um, which face the country? Next slide. I think the, um, quite often there's a caricature of the debate about global Britain. On the one hand, um, a rather optimistic, almost hubristic view that finally, freed from the shackles of the European Union, Britain can bestride the global stage, a return to you know, our 19th century dominance, dominance. Um, a return to, um, to, to Britain based upon our imperial and commonwealth past, at last restored. Or on the other hand, not the imperial Britain, but the, British, the Britain diminished view, the idea that Britain leaving the European Union post-Brexit is now um, you know, a hugely diminished uh, power, um, lacking clout, lacking influence. And what we're going to argue in this paper is that actually there is a middle way between the hubris or the pessimism of these two kind of extreme views. We're quite used to the idea in Britain at the moment um, that the, the, the extremes define the debate extremes of uh, optimism about Brexit or the pessimism um, of deep remain. But the question is, what is this global Britain and what choices does it face for the future of our country? And just as Ed was saying, where can we locate global Britain between these twin poles of Imperial Britain and Britain diminished? One of the first things we came across in our research was that Actually, there's a lot of debate about whether Global Britain has any substance behind it at all. The Foreign Affairs Committee explored the government's ambitions and objectives for Global Britain in 2018 and came away with this rather sad conclusion. The only thing that is clear about Global Britain is that it is unclear what it means, what it stands for, or how its success should be measured. And in fact, perception of Global Britain as a substanceless uh, PR campaign has become quite widespread as encapsulated here by this tweet by Hugo Rickind, the Times sketch writer, who says, big relief to hear Pretty Patel on the radio explaining that Britain is at the forefront of global Britain. Imagine how embarrassing it would be if it was somewhere else. France, maybe. Awful. To find out what global Britain could mean in terms of a series of economic policy choices, we conducted a series of interviews with representatives from business, academia, and those at the heart of policymaking in government within the UK. We also spoke to senior policymakers in the EU, as well as from countries such as Australia, Singapore, and Canada, who we felt would be able to provide particular insight into the UK situation as a mid-sized power navigating the new global economic world outside a large trading bloc. Our first clear finding from our research was that leaving the EU doesn't have to mean that the UK is consigned to economic and political destitution. The UK remains one of the largest economies in the world. And as this chart on the left-hand side shows, it remains the world's second largest service exporter. It also ranks highly internationally in terms of its business environment and institutional context and benefits from structurally strong positions in a variety of international organizations and fora, as well as holding good reputation for its civil service and diplomats. And this was encapsulated by two quotes from some of our interviewees. We've got Kevin Ellis from PwC UK. The UK has every opportunity to strengthen its position as a dynamic and trusted place for business. And a senior Bank of, of England official commented that the UK machine is good at operating in international fora and remains pretty powerful. We have good ideas and good networks. It's unlikely that this position is going to disappear overnight just as a result of leaving the EU. But at the same time, it could be eroded over time without a sensible strategy in place. However, despite that, 
A second finding was that suggestions to the effect that the UK could return to the days of sovereign trade and political dominance globally that it experienced in the past were equally unfounded. The world has changed significantly since the 1800s and even since the UK joined the EU. Previous trade dominance in the world was a function of the UK's position as a colonial imperialist empire and also its early adoption of the Industrial Revolution. And instead, even just over the last few decades, the global economy now represents a very different distribution of power and total factor productivity. Countries seeking to enter into trade deals, especially if they're seeking trade deals and services, often now have to accept a degree of integration with other economies, which often means sacrificing some sovereignty. And another a clear finding from this was that the UK was never going to be able to completely pivot away from Europe. The EU is always going to be an extremely important trade partner for the UK. And that is encapsulated by two quotes we have on the slide here. Firstly, by Thomas Sampson from the LSE. The UK is too small a country, both economically and militarily, to try and take the kind of role of the US, China, India, or the EU. Andy Burwell from CBI, if the UK wants to shape the future global environment, it can only do so through alliances and collective action. Linking foreign policy to trade sounds very colonial. So having rejected these two extremes, where can we find global Britain? Our interview suggested that the following elements could make up the core of a global Britain policy agenda. Firstly, trades policy, global rules or regulation, migration policy, domestic leveling up policy that aims to target inequality within the UK, and that all of those different policies need to factor into a compelling narrative about exactly what kind of country the UK is going to be outside the EU. Now, moving on to the first area that we identified, trade policy, our interviewees drew out the following challenges for the UK. Firstly, whether the UK should prioritize multilateral, bilateral or plurilateral trade deals, whether UK trade behavior should be collaborative, conciliatory or adversarial, and then also how trade goals or trade outcomes should be prioritized against other domestic outcomes. Our findings from these interviews were as such, reviving multilateral trade is a difficult long-term challenge, but bilateral deals are too narrow to offer significant upside benefit. Plurilateral deals have more immediate potential, particularly in services, and can be stepping stones towards multilateralism. The EU and the US might be reluctant to engage in a new push in service sector liberalization, but the UK should keep the door open for them to join. An adversarial approach with the EU is not in the UK's interest. And new trading relationships must not alienate our most significant trading partner. Then finally, trading relations which deliver domestic outcomes and greater equality should be prioritized. And an example of a policy that would achieve that was greater support for SMEs. Some quotes from our interviewees that back up these conclusions are from the senior UK Treasury official. Nobody is particularly optimistic about multilateral trade or reviving the WTO. People will talk about it, but there is no real sense that it will happen quickly. David Wright, a former EU Commission official. I see nothing wrong with building out from coalitions of the willing. But global trade cannot operate without a global um, dispute settlement mechanism. A senior UK government official, things won't move forward on the multilateral front, so the implications to do things bilaterally or plurilaterally. I can imagine a plurilateral initiative and services. A Brussels-based foreign office official told us that the EU will be watching UK attempts to build more Pacific-facing relationships like a hawk. And then finally, Rosa Crawford from the TUC, if the UK strikes future trade deals that lock in the highest standards through effective enforcement mechanisms, we could set a precedent for global trade. Our international interviewees also provided the following insights into the UK situation. Firstly, Wayne Swan, former Australian finance minister, told us that when looking at trade strategies at this minute, it's a pretty murky world. It's fair to say that there is much to learn about how to operate in a less friendly world. Tharman Shan Magutram, senior minister of Singapore told us, if multilateralism isn't possible, a second best approach is to find a way towards it. The UK's aim to join CPTPP is a very good example. The US may join too, de facto creating something close to multilateralism. And then finally, Mark, Carn uh, Mark Carney, former Canadian G7 Sher Sherpa and former governor of the Bank of England, told us that Canada, Singapore and Switzerland will be persuadable on services, 
think the UK should convince the US that services liberalization is the way to get a decent surplus to China. I'm now gonna hand over to my fellow co-author, Sechi. Thanks, Jess. Um, so our second building block was around the area of global rules of the game. And the three que questions we addressed in our paper were the following. What is the UK's post-Brexit regulatory philosophy? On which global issues should the UK take a leadership position? And finally, where should the UK diverge or remain within the EU regulatory orbit? And the conclusions that we got to in our interviews were the following. The UK is too small to impose its regulatory approach on the world, and it's too large to simply be a rule taker. Brokerage and innovation offer an alternative. The UK's expertise, experience and international standing in financial services, climate change, technology and global taxation are areas for brokerage. The G7 presidency demands UK leadership on COVID recovery, technology and multilateral tax reform. And COP will be a second big test of global Britain. As one of the largest donors to COVAX, a leader in the vaccination race and with its world leading life science sector, the UK can drive post pandemic resilience. Finally, regulatory divergence from the EU is going to be challenging, but leading or brokering regulatory reform requires risk taking. In financial services, there are opportunities, but in data privacy, the risk of antagonizing the EU may be too great. Um, and some of, the, some of the quotes we got from our interviews are the following. Senior Downing Street official, we're bigger than Singapore and Canada and more, more confident as a global player than Japan. Between the US and EU, we must be smart and nimble. Tony Danka, CBI. Britain needs a leapfrog strategy, using its regulatory freedoms to get to a world of 2030 faster, rather than simply thinking how to show Brussels this has all been worth it. Senior Bank of England official. If you can show that something works in a fairly chunky mid-sized economy that's globally integrated, that's powerful. And finally, Simon Usherwood, University of Surrey. In practice, in practice, like it or not, we will have to broadly follow EU rules. Senior European Commission official. There are certainly some areas where the UK leads, and I can see that you might wish to be at the forefront of international processes. Thurman Shanmugaratnam. One of the opportunities for bilateral and plur plur plurilateral deals is freeing up the digital economy and digital connectivity. Mark Carney. There's a period of time where there may, may be some issues such as data privacy. You can't do without the EU. I'd advocate others to lead on service, services liberal, liberalization so it doesn't look like a direct UK confrontation with the EU. Maria de Matzis. When the political dust settles, then we will realize, we will realize that the UK regulation wise is a lot closer to the EU than it thinks. Our third building block was around migration and the questions we addressed in our paper here were, what kinds of migration does the UK need? What should the UK's approach to migration be? And what is the global Britain story around migration? And the conclusions we got to were, ending free movement with the EU doesn't mean closing borders. Indeed, the government actually accepts the need for high-skilled labor. Migration policy also requires choices on how global Britain responds to shortages of low-skilled and seasonal workers, supports higher education, and faces up to Britain's aging population. To, support, to sustain support for migration, the government must persuade the public that there is effective and fair control over immigration. The narrative on managing migration will shape how global Britain is seen by potential or remaining migrants and domestic voters. And some of the quotes from our interviews are the following. Senior Downing Street official, our points-based immigration system is deliberately designed to make it easier for high-skilled immigrants to come in and more difficult for low-skilled. Sajid Javid, lower unskilled migration will be good because it will force businesses to increase productivity of a more limited, more expensive workforce. Jonathan Portas, sectors like hospitality will either shrink because of COVID-19, in which case migration doesn't matter, or their recovery will be inhibited because the migration system won't fill vacancies. The indications are this government won't back down just because businesses suffer. Senior Bank of England official. Free movement as a slogan was disastrous as people felt like there was no control. By changing the rhetoric to grip and control, similar to Australia, the UK can set quite an open migration policy whilst letting people feel it is under control. Joe Johnson. Even if, even if we've still got net migration of 300,000 a year plus, that doesn't matter anymore because we're in control. 
Some of the quotes from our international interviews are the following. Mark Carney, effective inward immigration policy has been demand driven in the UK. It's a totally different culture in Canada where immigration is really welcome. Dharman, good immigration policy might be aligned to maximizing and protecting jobs. In Singapore, this means being very liberal at the top and bottom of incomes and a little tighter in the middle, but that might not be the right formula for the UK. Wayne Swan, we've managed to avoid the full scale revolt against migration that has been seen elsewhere. The implication of the point system is that we have chosen the people who come in. Maria de Matzis. The UK was always effective at getting immigration at all ends of the skills distribution to meet its shortages and from all corners of the world. The EU was a big supplier of labour, a flow that will undoubtedly be disturbed in the short run. Our fourth building block was around the levelling up agenda and the questions we addressed in our paper were the following. What is the Global Britain strategy for promoting growth and levelling up? Should Britain level up through freer trade or through more controls on trade? And finally, what example can UK, the UK show the world about managing globalization? Um, the conclusions we found were delivering fairer domestic outcomes, both regionally and between cities and towns is vital for global Britain. Our interviewees rejected simply undercutting international competition and instead advocated investing in innovation, skills, infrastructure and trade adjustment assistance. The UK must replace European policies on state aid and agricultural policy and find a new constitutional settlement to sustain the union. Other countries will be watching closely. The economic and political divides that global Britain must tackle are common to many countries. And some of the quotes are the following. Senior Downing Street official. The only way that the UK can square its free trading market-based approach is to be quite a lot less free market when it comes to regional growth. Tom Reardon. London cannot survive on its own. The UK cannot be just about the capital. The reason London can be what it is is because of the other parts of Britain. Sajid Javid. There's nothing wrong with shifting jobs from an area of high employment to an area of low employment to improve equity across the country. David Wright. It looks like the Scots are going to go and Northern Ireland may also decide to leave. You can't play a global Britain role while the whole country is disintegrating. And from our international interviews, um, Rem Kortoweg. Global Britain has to first clear the pretty high bar of not becoming global England. Mark Carney. We should build thresholds up to a certain size for SMEs to achieve distributed globalization. Through this, the UK can also keep sovereignty in terms of rules, hygiene and financial stability. Thurman, global Britain must enable growth in incomes in the middle. This has to be about constant investment in human capital and inclusive growth. You need to properly regenerate areas across the board to avoid a Brexit type perception of who is gaining and who is losing. Maria de Matzis, the issue of inequality is crucial. Growth needs to be sustainable, and if it's not equitable, it's not sustainable. I'm going to pass it back to Jess for the final building block. Thank you, Sophie. So our final building block was the na narrative that surrounds all of these policy decisions. And the two challenges that we addressed in our paper were, firstly, why does the narrative matter? And secondly, what can other countries teach Britain? Our conclusions were that this year, Britain will begin to develop its narrative through its response to COVID-19 in the G7 and in the vaccine rollout, through climate policy at COP, and through its decisions on migration and levelling up. Our international interviews advised that the global Britain narrative needs to be outward looking and collaborative, not adversarial, humble, not arrogant, and consistent between its international and domestic audiences. Our UK interviews stressed that hubris and pessimism risk undermining the Global Britain narrative and that Global Britain must show the public and the world it is addressing internal divides within the UK. A Brussels-based Foreign Office official told us that Global Britain has been around for a long time. It doesn't communicate terribly well. We simply state that we want global reach. As a consequence, it seems hubristic rather than that we merit global reach through hard work. Tom Riordan, the message cannot be an imperial vision anymore. The way other countries do it, such as New Zealand and Canada, is largely being an outside player in collaboration with other countries. And a senior treasury official told us, there has been a lot of hubris in British politics in recent years. 
Whatever the shenanigans in Parliament, the Treasury has successfully prevent, presented itself as a sensible player internationally, but this won't last forever. Wayne Swan, if the UK did a roadshow about returning to a world of Commonwealth trading relationships to launch Global Britain, that would be spectacularly unsuccessful and in itself harmful. A senior European Commission official. It's difficult to foresee anyone trusting a version of the UK as a leader or a broker when it has just abandoned its opportunity to do brokerage in the deepest international agreement, the EU. And Mark Carney, you need to let the big blocks get the glory. That's easy if you're Canada, you're just glad to be at the table. That's much harder for the UK, which used to be an empire and world power. The UK needs to be tactical and appropriately humble. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Ed to close us out. So we end with um, uh, these questions and with, um, I think, an understanding that we are in the, the foothills of um, defining um, what global Britain is actually going to be. The combination of exhaustion after Brexit and the negotiation of the, um, the Brexit deal and COVID means that um, there's not been a huge amount of looking forward yet, certainly on economic policy. And yet we have the G7 presidency this year, but we have the COP talks um, coming up. There's a tendency um, for those on the Brexit side to just assume the answers to these questions are straightforward. And that is where the hubris comes from. I think on the, um, on the other side, a tendency to want to dismiss uh, global Britain. But of course, that's very bad politics um, for um, Keir Starmer and the, the Labour Party. The question is, what kind of global Britain will we now have? On trade, what direction will we take? Britain first bilateralism, building on the EU relationship, new plurilateral alliances or multilateralism. On regulation, competitive deregulation, or trying to broker through leadership new global agreements. On migration, clamping down on unskilled migration, or trying to build a new consensus for fair and effective managed migration. On leveling up, is there a strategy? And can it save the union? On narrative, is there a vision of global Britain that can be sold to both the British public and the world, which, is, which doesn't fall into the hubris trap that our international um, uh, people we spoke to um, warned us of? So those are the questions. Um, and that's um, the beginning of this debate this evening. And um, we have, um, as I said, a very distinguished group of people to, to, to respond and shape their view of what global Britain can and should be and how the UK and particularly the UK government, um, but also the opposition can navigate their way through this in the next months and years. As I said, we're going to hear from Paul Tucker, former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, a senior uh, research fellow at the Musaro Amani Centre, from Sajid Javid, former Chancellor um, and a, um, a senior fellow, but first of all, former Downing Street um, Policy Chief, um, also a senior fellow, fellow, Camilla Cavendish. So Camilla, first of all, over to you. Thanks, Ed. Hello, everybody. So, so um, there's a lot of interesting stuff in this paper, and um, I'm sure we'll get to all of it, but I, I'll, I'll try and pick off a few parts if I can. Um, I mean, I, perhaps I'll start where you ended, which is with narrative. Um, and I guess I'm never convinced as to whether there is a narrative you can really sell. Um, but I totally agree with the points in the paper that whatever the narrative is, the, the attitude has to be humble and it has to be outward looking. And I think it's really about tone. So even if we don't have a full story that we can put everything underneath, it, the tone, it seems to me, is vital. And the last four years, Britain has been unbelievably inward looking. I mean, the debate in Britain has been extraordinarily insular. And I think a lot of our international partners have just looked on in amazement, really. Um, and it's left us, as I think Ed was alluding to, it's left us, I fear, not very well prepared for the post-Brexit world because there's been an awful lot of go-it-alone mentality, which has not actually taken on the realities of some of what you've just spoken about. And clearly, if Britain can join the CPTPP, that would be a very good example of where those kind of alliances are going to be vital. But, but I think a lot, of the, a lot of the message from government has continued to be that somehow Britain is going to go it alone, which, which is simply uh, not true. And 
there's been an awful lot of sort of jingoism and when we've had it over vaccines we're actually having failed on almost every aspect of the corona crisis britain's done quite well on vaccines and unfortunately one or two cabinet ministers have um managed to turn that into a sort of horrendously jingoistic claims about our brilliance now um when i was thinking about that i was thinking well who are the faces of global britain actually because it's not just the story you tell but it's who is going to be telling the story um so i think one of the issues for the current government is it does not have enough people around the cabinet table who have the kind of credibility the outward looking views and the experience that we actually need to sell global britain i'm afraid um i think you know if the, if this government can get past the Brexit moment, it ought to be reshuffling the cabinet in a, in a very different way and bringing in, I mean, I would personally bring in people from all sorts of different political parties, because I think we are, we are in a sort of almost national emergency situation where we, we can kind of need to get it right for the next few years. Now that won't actually happen, but I do think it's worth just thinking about who are the faces of global Britain. Um, COP26 um, has a very nice minister um, running it called Alok Sharma, but he's, again, he's not a known quantity in the world. Uh, Mark Carney is, and he's a great asset to that plan. But again, I think, you know, the Prime Minister probably wants to start thinking about um, co-opting a few kind of bigger, bigger names into this, into this picture. Um, so one point I wanted to make was, was about services. I think you, very early on in the presentation, you talked about Britain as a powerhouse of services. Now, again, this, this point has been lost in so much of the media and political debate. For four years, most of our debate in Britain has been about goods. Um, I think the, the lack of understanding in the political class, and I, I mean, I'm a journalist myself, and I, I admit, you know, I think also in the media, the, the reality of a services economy and what it needs to flourish is, is really surprising and quite alarming. Um, and, and there needs to be quite a lot of work done really fast, I think, on, on fully educating the political class about what that means. Um, you know, London is currently... I mean, the city of London, I think Brussels has offered us, Paul, probably only two out of 40 areas where we wanted market access. I mean, they're being very, very slow on the city of London. Um, we are losing out even on sort of tech IPOs to Asia and the US. So positioning ourselves as we should do as a financial services, global financial services hub um, is challenging. I know Jonathan Hill's doing a review, which, which could be very useful. But I think, again, I'm not convinced that the current government is really focused on this. I think there's a backdrop to all this, and Sajid may correct me, but I think there's a backdrop drop, which is that there's a view in Downing Street that big business uh, voted to remain in the referendum. And they really don't want to engage with big business very much. And they're very, very focused on SMEs, which is good. But, but if you had that quote in there from PwC, you know, about the great prospects for global Britain, I mean, those are the kind of people <laughs> <laughs> the government needs to find uh, perhaps a better way of, of dealing with. Um, I'll just make three more points if I can. Migration, um, again, I thought very interesting uh, in the paper. Um, you know, in principle, obviously, a global Britain should be using the best and brightest from all over the world and making them a really big offer to come here and contribute. Um, and some of that will happen. Um, in practice, though, I'm not as confident as I think Joe Johnson was in his quote. He said, you know, we can have 300,000 people coming a year because we've got control. I think there will still be a residual Brexit effect of people wanting to see evidence of control through lower numbers. And I think that's going to be really quite difficult as welfare queues lengthen in the recession. I think there will be some flashpoints there, despite the fact that the NHS... Everybody in Britain can now see that the NHS relies heavily, heavily on EU labour and people from all over the world. And that there's a great public sympathy for that. But I do think that we have to tread a bit carefully on um, migration control and not be perhaps as, as optimistic as the paper was. Um, but there are two areas where I think, you know, Britain could and should take a leadership position. Um, one is science where, you know, actually, there are a whole series of questions about post-pandemic resilience. Um, you know, we have led in vaccines, we have uh, a really good life sciences base. I mean, other countries like Singapore have been trying to poach that base for many, many years. They haven't succeeded. Um, reinforcing that base, attracting those scientists, building the infrastructure, building the Oxford-Cambridge Triangle, um, all of those things I think will be vital. And I suspect that donating vaccines 
uh, to developing countries and doing a huge push for that will be very, very important. Um, and the last one is obviously um, climate, where I think the government has a 10 point plan, which I think is just too broad and not focused enough. Um, but in fact, we do have some real strengths in climate technology um, with wind, you know, and we're building a whole lot of offshore wind and there's quite a lot of potential for electrics. But again, it's really your, your some of your charts just just um, reminded me of the fact that this is a government which has gone through Brexit, which has gone through Covid and has an enormously ambitious domestic policy agenda. It is, it is trying to work up policies in almost every area. Um, so I think that part of Global Britain is going to be about making some tough choices and actually slimming down some of those policies. Uh, and I'll leave it there, Ed. Thank you very much indeed, um, Camilla. That was, that, was, that was a perfect start for us. Um, just to remind people that um, if you've got questions, um, which, which we'll come to after Sajin Paul, do put them in the, in the, uh, the, the uh, Q&A. Um, we're going to go to uh, 7.30. I know not all of our panellists can stay all the way to the end, but um, thank you. That, that was excellent, Camilla. Um, over to former Chancellor Sajid Javid. Thank you very much, uh, Ed, and uh, thanks to you and your team for doing this work and uh, the, the fresh thinking that you're providing on this really, really important issue and, and for inviting me. But first, can I just begin by saying that, that yes, the UK has uh, left the EU, and that's partly what's you know, prompted this uh, research and this paper, and rightly so. But it's, it's important, I think, to emphasize also that the UK has not left uh, the world stage. You know, the UK is still you know, a leading member of the G7, the G20, NATO, the Commonwealth, the P5 power, a newly independent member of the WTO. It's a capable military power, the second biggest spender in the NATO, a nuclear power, and has huge soft power assets around the world. This aid budget, even with the recent cut, that was announced as the second largest aid budget of any country in the world, its culture around the world, its language, the list goes on. But the, 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 despite the UK leaving the EU, and of course that was a huge divorce and a huge moment, and it prompts thinking about the future, the UK is still very much uh, on the world stage. The this next thing I, I wanted to say, just to link in with um, one of your first slides, was that you know, when that debate was going on uh, in the UK about the EU and, and, and the referendum was going on, I mean, the, the, the fear was that there were two sort of visions, and I think you rightly touched on them. One was the, if you can, I've sort of always referred to it as the, those people that are sort of inward looking, and they're sort of harking back to some Britain that probably never really existed in any case, but they're sort of saying that Britain should be more inward looking, let's pull up the drawbridge and, and, and let's disengage uh, from the world. But there was also, and I think that group of people, maybe represented more by UKIP, uh, that party and its leadership, uh, was very different to what uh, hopefully has prevailed and what I uh, strongly support. And I think what was coming through with most of the sort of commentary that you had from the people that you interviewed is that it actually it's about Britain being outward looking, remaining outward looking, if anything, becoming even more open and engaging with the world. It's one of the things that's made Britain a success uh, a, both economically, culturally, and in so many ways for many decades in the successive governments. Uh, but uh, that, that vision, I think, is shared by most you know, parliamentarians, most people around Westminster. Yes, there are still some people around, and I think they're a minority, that are, are hoping even now against hope that somehow Britain rejoins the EU. That's not going to happen. And I think most people have accepted that we've moved on, but that doesn't mean Britain's going to disengage, but we will still be open to talent, investment, to trade around the world. Then touching on uh, so, you know, three or four of the, the main things that you mentioned, and first on trade, you know, my own uh, view is, and I think this is how it started, this is how it will stay, is that yes, despite the pressures of the pandemic you know, on countries uh, to become uh, more resilient in certain uh, areas, uh, I, I think there is no trade-off. I think sometimes people present there's some kind of trade-off between national resilience and, 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 and being open to trade. And I don't think there's necessarily any uh, trade-off uh, there. And that the UK, you know, already having signed the trade agreement uh, with the EU, uh, has signed all more, already 60 other trade deals. Yes, they are continuations. There's not an increase in, the, in, in our sort of uh, trade uh, relationships from where we were before, but it set the direction. And, and I do think that in terms of bilateral trade deals, clearly the, the biggest prize would be a US trade deal. 
Uh, I think that's going to, you know, despite the change in the U.S. presidency, I think there's other things that are priorities, understandably, especially with the pandemic and climate change and things. So, but that remains a, something the U.K. Uh, will continue to pursue. Uh, and I think what was mentioned about uh, plurilateral uh, trade deals, in particular the CPTPP, the fact that the UK has formally began negotiations to try and accede to that, was a long, long way to go. But I think it sets uh, uh, the direction of travel where the UK would want to be. Um, on regulation, I think it was well put earlier when uh, the, one of your researchers, uh, Ed, had said that you know, Britain is perhaps you know, uh, too small in itself to set the global rules. Uh, but also it's too large to be a global uh, rule taker. And I do absolutely see a, a big role for the UK uh, in terms of being, let's call it that broker, that conciliator. And I think we're already going to see much of that this year when we get to November and the COP26 with the work I know Alok and others are already working on, um, including with the US administration and many others on, you know, when it comes to climate change, there's going to be new rules and that are going to be required now that you know Biden is president and not Trump. You know you're going to have real proper engagement with the U.S. on that, which means you'll get proper engagement for the Chinese, which means that the U.K. is in a fantastic role to really have a landmark uh, climate change uh, agreement. Also, the WTO, you know, UK now being a full independent member, I think in one of your quotes. I think it was it from Mark Carney about the importance of services and the UK trying to take a leadership role on that. The WTO, that's the big gap uh, that's existed in global trade. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a big challenge, but again, I think the UK has got every reason to try and show leadership uh, on that. And then the other, the, in my opening remarks thing, I definitely want to touch on was on migration. You know, a lot has been said about on migration in your presentation. Camilla made some excellent remarks uh, as well. And, uh, and I absolutely see the UK uh, being open, remaining open to talent uh, from across the world. Yes, it doesn't mean it's going to happen by having the freedom of movement arrangements that we had before. It's going to be this already instituted now, early days, but instituted plan of, let's call it Australian style, Canadian style, your know, points based system. Yes, it will focus more on high skills, but already from what we've seen is... Uh, I think two or three really clear demonstrations of where the UK is going with that. And, 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 and I'll contrast that actually with my own time as a, a former Home Secretary, which uh, uh, for your listeners that meant that I was overseeing the UK's immigration and, and border policy, amongst other things. And, uh, and I have to say, I think that in, in, the, in that cabinet, when Theresa May was the Prime Minister, I think she was the only one in her own cabinet that actually believed in the policy of let's get immigration down to tens of thousands. I don't think there was any other member of the British cabinet at that time that actually thought that was a viable or indeed a sensible policy for the UK government. And I certainly did not as Home Secretary. And what it was much more about, I think that whole debate around immigration was around control, uh, as others have said, and some people said in your research, but the other side of that control and something that hasn't been mentioned uh, thus far was the importance um, of what I'd call integration as well. And, and I did a lot of work on that in, in one of my other roles as the local government and communities uh, secretary. We did a, did a commission, a landmark independent study by a, a, a fantastic woman called Louise Casey on integration in the UK. And what really comes through when I looked at it from that perspective, as well as then immigration policy, is that it, you know, the, the perception that for many British people, the vast majority, it's not so much about the numbers, it's much more about control and integration, that, that the people who come to Britain, that settle in Britain, respect Britain's broadly put British values. And, and some of the changes that I've made and that have continued around English language tests, for example, before you become a citizen, um, even sort of uh, British values, British history tests, you know, things that, that sort of uh, identify uh, the, 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 your uh, desire to become British. I think that's, that's really important. And I think that will pick up uh, over time, but um, that, that is an important part of the debate on immigration, less about numbers, more about control, and the people that come to settle actually respect Britain. I mean, for example, in the study that, uh, that uh, I did on integration, it found that there were almost a million people out of a total population of 60 million old, there were a million people uh, that were living in Britain, uh, British citizens, uh, almost all of them, uh, and they did not speak English. 
And there are people that lived in Britain, tens of thousands of them for 30, 40 years and did not speak English. And I, and I think that was you know, a, a real uh, issue when it comes to the whole debate about migration and talent. Uh, and then finally, just on migration, I would mention uh, you know, examples of Britain's direction of travel uh, on this and proof of what I've said is look at the decisions that have already been made by the government uh, on students, you know, turning over some of the rules that came in years ago um, uh, uh, under the coalition government and uh, saying that actually British student, foreign students that come to Britain can stay on beyond, beyond their study for at least a couple of years, uh, science visas, cultural visas, but most of all, look at the decision on Hong Kong nationals uh, with what's going in Hong Kong from Britain to turn around you know, a few months ago and to say any uh, Hong Kong uh, citizen that is a holder of a British uh, overseas uh, uh, passport, a British national uh, overseas uh, citizen, a BNOC as it's called, they can all come to the UK and settle here permanently if they want to. They can work stu and study here and uh, live here. Uh, and bring their dependents. That's potentially up to 4 million people. Now, of course, 4 million won't come, but the point is that Britain has, has uh, opened its hands and said, you know, come and uh, join us if you're in trouble. You know, come and Britain won't let you down. And I think that's a really good sign of what global Britain will be. Perfect, Sajid, thank you much indeed. I've got, uh, I've got a question I want to ask you, but I'm gonna have to come back to that in a minute. Um, but thank you. Um, over to um, our third discussant, um, Paul Tucker, who, as it happens, is a research fellow at the Muscle Romani Center. It distinguishes him from everybody else. It's good, good to see you all, and it's thank you very much, everybody, for joining. And if you want to ask Sajid a question now before you forget, that will no, no, be fine. fine. No, 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 no. no. All right, all right. Um, so it's been very interesting listening to the um, to the three of you. The, the only thing that distinguishes me from everybody else that's spoken is that I was an unelected um, official rather than elected or serving um, an elected official. So I start from thinking, so this is the payback period for Brexit is maybe kind of 20, 25 years before we can really see the kind of um, effects it will have and, and to reap the opportunities that it, that it provides. So the first thing to say is that that's, of course, much longer than the life of any elected government. And so setting a medium term policy rather than bank being driven around um, with a series of short term policies is going to be very important and I suspect rather difficult. The second thing in the same vein is that Britain embarks on this during a really remarkable um, period in the world. Remarkable for two reasons. First of all, geopolitical change on a scale um, and in nature that, on a scale that we haven't seen since the Second World War, and of a nature that we haven't seen for over two centuries, um, because it is a new rising state, has a very different system and, and ideology of government. So that that's, a massive, massive part of the context that will complicate everything and has already. The other is that, that um, the world has been experiencing incredibly um, low productivity growth, and that makes all public policy much harder. And I shall come on to that um, in particular when we reach leveling up. Um, I, I won't say very much about narrative, although, except the thing about narrative which is really about explaining policy to different audiences is that you have to have the policy and then explain it the policy has to lead the narrative rather than the narrative leading the, the policy and that actually will be quite given what i said about long-run horizons versus short-term expedience that actually will be quite difficult for politicians to achieve so on on the headings that um, um you and jessica and seshi set um, trade. So this is going to be bruising. I mean, and that's not because Brexit's a bad idea or because we're not a great country. It's just going to be bruising because trade negotiations favor the big. And so some trade negotiations are going to be easier than others, but the ones we really care about are going to be very um, difficult. Um, if we en ever enter into 
trade negotiations seriously with the US, I think we will find it quite extraordinarily um, bruising and we'll discover the names of all sorts of people in the House in districts that turn out to matter because they hold the veto vote um, in, the, in the House. The Pacific thing, I agree with what everyone has said about, about that. It will, be, it will be good to join, um, partly because I think that such trade agreements are probably the future of international trade and indeed of foreign policy, but also as a way of, of trying to build alliances in other parts of the world. I, I think a very interesting, I don't have a prediction around this, I think it'll be a very interesting thing how, to see how difficult or easy that is. I wouldn't expect them to make it easy. I think that would not because of any points about the UK or Britain, but because as they, as they manage their very important um, emerging trading bloc, they need to kind of send signals to others who may want to um, join. All of this, of course, has been affected by the US dropping out of... Um, out of the scheme, which is probably the greatest US foreign policy mistake um, for a very, very long time. Um, human capital. I mean, the thing that's going to drive trade is the human capital and the efficiency of the economy of Britain, not the particular um, trade deals. Um, we need an education system at every level that is just needs to be in a different league from what we achieve, except at the very at the very top. Um, and I, I, I really do defer to others on this. I think, I think it must be incredibly hard for leading politicians to talk honestly to the British public about, and I'm deliberately going to put it in code, about the human capital um, of, um, in, in, in Britain and what needs to be done. Um, to improve it. There's a positive story to be told related to levelling up, of course, but one needs to be open about the starting point. The other thing I would say on trade um, is I think it will be painful in the short run, but I think much better policy would be made over the medium to long run if, if the government does publish evaluations um, of all the trade deals that it reaches. I mean, the, the areas of policy that I was involved with in um, were immensely helped, immeasurably almost helped um, by external scrutiny and, and research. So let me say something about regulation. Um, the tone so far is, is we're not gonna be a regulatory superpower in the way that probably, probably the EU is the last regulatory um, superpower. Um, but the thing about regulation in all fields is that things to be really good at it and be a magnet so that people from around the world phone up and say, can I come and see you and talk about what the, I mean, you, got, you people are just doing such a good job on X and, and Y. And I say that partly because I think it's immensely important and partly because I don't think many of our regulators are very good at all um, by international standards, let alone relative to um, any absolute level. And frankly, I don't think there are good enough um, people in them. And I think their structure which is kind of an inheritance from new public management. We have these kind of boards um, with a single CEO rather than um, commissions of policymakers actually damages the quality um, of, of lots of our regulators. And I think we, we have already seen that paraded before us and we will see it again and again until we fix that. Meanwhile, one specific thing is, my goodness, does our competition um, regulatory authority need to be absolutely world class as a competition authority, which is separate from being a body that does consumer protection rather, rather well. Remember that the elite part of Brussels is the competition um, bit. And remember that even the Stigler Center, kind of, you know, the, the globe center of, of antitrust analysis would probably think the commission um, was the lead in the world. So we need to aim very high for that. We need to be very ambitious about that. Um, I could say something about the city later, but I won't. Now, immigration. Um, you all know much more about this than me. What I'm struck when, when you didn't all do this, but in the presentation talked about, we want high-skilled people rather than low-skilled people. I mean, you all know this, but 
I mean, the art of policy often bumps in to where the boundary is. What about medium skill um, people? Um, what's your what's policy on medium skill people? Where's that line going to be drawn? And separately, does high skilled mean paid a lot? I mean, I think a load of jobs in finance aren't high skilled at all, frankly. They just happen to be paid a lot because there are problems in the labor market in that part of the economy. What we want is high skilled in the sense that actually the annuity value over the long term is very, is very high, which certainly includes scientists. Um, on leveling up, oh my God, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a man who was once a boy from outside Wolverhampton. I feel very strongly about, about what's happened in our country. It's much harder with zero productivity growth. In a world with very low productivity growth, every single policy is distributional. There is a loser. Uh, there is a there is a loser for every winner in a in a world with zero productivity growth. It is politically impossible, frankly, to navigate successfully. Um, I, if I had a dream, it would be that I could wake up in fifty to one hundred years time and discover that the only world class universities in the UK weren't part of Greater London, but actually. We're in the we're in the north, and with a huge spin-off creating. I mean, that's the if you want travel around travels around America, the the declining steel towns which had strong universities have survived. The declining steel towns without strong universities um, have not. I was surprised when just I think it was Jessica that presented this bit. Um, state aid was included in something about the leveling up. Policy And my response is, oh, God, if you think you're going to level up by tweaking subsidies um, here or there, actually, you know, the public choice people have got this broadly right. That will get so distorted towards marginal constituencies and other favors that have to be done in the rough and tumble of, of politics. I think the bigger thing, though, is Britain needs to decide... Um, what its broad framework for policy is. Is it gonna be, to use kind of language that will be familiar in the Kennedy School, is it kind of gonna be ordo liberal like, like Germany, or is it gonna be the embedded liberalism of, of John Ruggie and people like that? I don't really know and haven't known for a while what kind of, how, what vision for the economy um, fits with a vision for society. Um, in which is different, where, the, where an account of that has to talk about the structure of the economy and, um, and how resources are allocated. Not, it doesn't talk about who we'd like to make better off, because of course we'd like to make the poor um, better off. You'll have seen, Ed, that I've hardly talked about Global Britain at all, because I think Global Britain will be an outcome. And actually the way to do it is to attend to all the problems, many, I'm afraid, some of them very deep, in British society. And I think the real upside from Brexit is that it has made it possible to talk about things that should remain buried for far too long. Thank you, Paul. Um, we had a question from Anas, um, which is actually about financial services. Could you elaborate um, on prospects of financial services, especially in the light of recent news? The city has lost its top spot in Europe and EU reluctance to give equivalents. That's clearly a question for you. But I'm going to add, add that to another question, which I think is, is we talked to lots of very senior people in the centre of government and in the bank. And I think that they believe the UK can be effective in international fora, um, in regulatory conversation and even broaching new deals if it's done in a careful alliance building, brokering manner. It, it, uh, a bit like um, the, the words from... Mark Carney and Wayne and Thalmud about, about being effective but humble at the same time. Um, do, you think it's, do you think that's possible politically? Do you think it's possible for the UK post-Brexit to be, to be humble um, and alliance building? And what do you think that's going to mean for um, the, the future of financial services? Who are you asking, Ed? You. Oh, um... On, on the narrow question about the city, I always say the same thing. And I think it's because I was taught to think this uh, by people like Eddie George and George Blunden. 
Um, sound finance, honest finance, open finance, be patient. Don't be driven by, um, we'll, we'll drop standards here and we'll drop standards there. Light touch regulation was just about the most stupid phase of British regulatory um, policy and finance I can um, remember. I mean, most of the cities, you have to do all of those things and then just wait for other people to make mistakes and not lose your nerve during periods when they don't. And, and I'm gonna put this very obliquely. Um, I think it's very important not to sound scratchy, um, not to sound kind of angry, but that to sound reasonably um, positive. I think there are some things that actually could be done where people around the world go, oh, wow, they're really serious about this. Um, of course, all of those are around stability. I mean, the one thing, this is true of the West generally, the one thing that the UK cannot possibly afford is any kind of wholesale or retail financial crisis um, whatsoever. It's, but these are all, everything I say will be about long time horizons that are difficult for politicians to adopt. In terms of what you say about participating in international meetings, and, and um, of course it's possible to do all of those um, things. I mean, I, I don't really understand the bit about humility because when you go to international meetings, there are all these people from other countries that are really, really good and know things that you don't know and say really interesting things. And for whom, um, actually even when, sometimes when they're not so good, you can pick up ideas and think, oh my, my goodness, that, we haven't used that. So you kind of have to be um, eclectic, um, not in broadcast um, mode, and most certainly, most certainly build um, alliances, um, build and and for real, not just for show, but for for real. So, so when it's costless to support a small or medium-sized country. Um, and no one else is bothering, do so. I once supported a very large country um, that was being beaten up by everybody. And I, 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 didn't, I couldn't figure out for a long time uh, why it was that such senior people in that country were quite keen on me. And actually it turned out because I was the only person in the room years before that had said, no, I think they're right. And you know, it's, it doesn't cost anything to do, to do that. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Camilla had to leave. We knew she had to leave at seven. Um, she knows a good question for her. Baroness Cavendish isn't um, uh, isn't um, Sunak isn't Sunak um, the um, the ideal face for global Britain in the current government? Um, I have to say, you could say the same thing about Sajid um, as well. Would you be a good face for um, for global Britain in the current government? Uh, but more importantly, how do you win that um, the migration the argument that you're putting earlier politically? How do you go about it? Um, I was uh, you talking about when I talked uh, when I was Home Secretary and what I referred to earlier. Yeah, but when you talked earlier about, about how Britain doesn't need to be closed, uh, I talked to other members of the cabinet. Uh, a lot, including those that uh, took a you know, more of an interest in migration because of their portfolios, for example, the then Chancellor uh, uh, and others, the Business Secretary, and uh, built a coalition of interest, let's call it, in the Cabinet and, and made it clear to the then Prime Minister that there wasn't enough support for what she was you know, setting out and, that it, and, and then basically became incredibly, I became incredibly stubborn just like her on that issue. <laughs> yeah how um i think the other question i wanted to ask you because you're the only elected politician um currently elected politician on the panel if you were if you were if you were um if you're keir starmer at the moment how would you be addressing the the challenge of post-brexit britain how would you think about uh, global britain um, well, I, I think that uh, the, the, the issues that you know, Keir Starmer's lead of the Labour Party is going to have to address is, is come to a settled policy on a lot of these big issues. Like, uh, it's not clear, 
you know, what the trade policy, and now that, you know, he's accepted, rightly so, you know, that Britain has left the EU and, and that's that, and we're going to move forward, that uh, what is uh, the Labour Party's view on, you know, on trade policies? And, and I, there's, uh, there's clearly these questions, and some have already come up in this discussion about the current governments, you know, the, how much it might pursue certain trade deals and things, but I think it's clearer and more coherent than where Keir uh, Starmer is, um, also on the issue of talent and migration, you know, what is the, the view? I think now, especially under Boris Johnson, it's, it's much more uh, you know, clearer. The, the agenda's been set. There's widespread support you know, throughout the, the, the government and the, and the members of the, the governing party for that. Uh, but a, again, on these issues of uh, both migration numbers and also the issues of integration and things, where does the Labour Party uh, stand uh, on that? Um, and then you know, regulation, uh, it's, uh, it, again, there's no sort of clear policy other than sticking with the uh, you know, uh, regulations that were inherited uh, from uh, the EU, but no, no sense of like a direction on that. So I just think there's a lot more questions uh, than there are answers. And uh, it would therefore just not uh, be credible at the moment, I think, for Keir Starmer to sort of set out and to say, you know, we believe in global Britain and these are the reasons why. Yeah, I think that the, um, for me, the, the politics of this is that um, if you are Keir Starmer, you can't really afford not to be for Britain and you can't really afford not to be, to be global. So the one thing you don't want to do is to be against global Britain. And um, you know, the, the polarized nature of our debate is very easy for people who voted the main to say um, global Britain is just a um, kind of a 19th century hubris or it's Boris Johnson's agenda to define themselves against it. It's very easy for us to keep refighting the, um, the referendum. But the reality is we're out now and you know, we are going to be chairing the G7 and the COP talks. We do need to be outward looking. We do need to be global Britain. But doesn't the debate now have to become what kind of global Britain are we going uh, to be? It's not global Britain, yes or no. Is, is it a global Britain which is more multilateral or more alliance building? Is it one which is more kind of humble or arrogant? Is it one which seeks to, um, to kind of to, to broaden alliances or to stay bilateral? one which tries to, to win the answer for um, sensible managed migration. I mean, there, there is a choice of, uh, in a way, the, the advantage of Paul said, he hardly mentioned Global Britain, is as yet undefined, but that's an opportunity, because there is actually a, within the Conservative Party, a debate about what Global Britain is going to be, and a debate across the aisle in the House of Commons now about different conceptions of Global Britain. And if I was Keir Starmer, I would be locating myself on that gr ground and talking about good versus global Britain versus bad, or a more progressive version, or a more internationalist version. At the moment, it feels as though um, the opposition you know, risks leaving that territory to um, the government, and that's that's politically quite risky. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. And, and I think the one of the reasons for that is that in amongst the conservative members of parliament, <coughs> as we know, the majority in Parliament, there is not a single Conservative MP that thinks we should relive the referendum and go through all of it again. Not a single one. Right? They all accept that we, we, are, we, we, we should leave and we've left, and, and that's that. Whereas it, within the Labour Party, there is still a, it's a minority, probably, but there's still a, 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 a group of you know, quite influential people that if you said to them tomorrow, you know, should we have another referendum, they'd jump at the chance. So we, we, we're looking to open this up to questions, other than a very odd um, bot. Um, we asked one of the, um, the, the questions, and in fact two of them. There was a question, the, the only other one so far on this, this screen is from Jed, who wants to ask Paul um, whether um, he agrees with um, the characterization of the UK's positions, the financial deregulation as being vastly too permissive. Um, I'm not uh, sure exactly what he's getting at there, um, but I don't know whether you want to try and try and answer that, Paul. Well, um, I mean, I don't know whether that means backward looking or, or forward um, looking. I think some opportunities have been missed 
to underpinning the resilience of the, um, the financial system, um, partly because the UK and others have managed to be in the kind of shadow of, of Washington in recent years. I think the Yellen Treasury will change that um, somewhat. I think, I think one has to make a big distinction between deregulation that goes to the kind of resilience of the system, which I think would be crazy, um, and deregulation which might make the system more um, dynamic, might increase risks to investors. And I see those as essentially political um, issues. And different parties at different times have different views on that. And most societies don't really kind of know where the optimal level of regulation um, is. And it kind of swings around and everyone shouts a lot about it. But that's actually because there isn't um, a deeply right policy. Whereas I think on the resilient side, um, it is different. It's just a really big mistake to have financial crises. Nothing good has ever come out of a, um, a big financial crisis as the world has been, world has been learning. Um, the other thing I would say, if I may, is that I, mean, I started off by mentioning geopolitics and, and very low productivity growth. The other thing that will make a difference to this um, nationally and the perceptions of our nation is what happens in Scotland and, um, and in Northern Ireland and in the island of, um, of Ireland. And I, I wouldn't, I, I kind of wouldn't presume to kind of offer a view on that, but I think it's quite important that we acknowledge that that is going to be very important. The other thing I would say um, is, that's a kind of shortish horizon thing. Um, the, the policies in the late 50s and the late 60s, this is particularly true in the Conservative Party, the people around Harold Macmillan, um, they changed their views or adapted their views partly because um, growth was kind of below that of the continent for a while. The most interesting thing, um, although I think it's the medium to long run that matters, there's going to be minute scrutiny um, over the next three or four years of is our growth above or below that of the uh, main economies on the, on the continent? And that is going to, whichever way that goes, that's going to blow back into domestic politics and therefore it will blow back into domestic policy. And the reason I say that is it's more like, that's more likely to have bad um, effects, forced, forced, um, cause unforced errors, if you like, if there isn't a clear sense of what kind of um, economy we want and what, how we want that to fit with um, society. And I don't hear that from either of the two main parties and actually haven't for a very long time. I think um, I'm gonna get Jess to um, come on and ask a, I think she's got a question to the um, two of you or the three of us. Um, if anybody else wants to ask questions, do post them on the Q&A. Um, because we've got a little bit more time. Jess? Thanks, Ed. Um, I want to ask all three of you, uh, one of the motivating parts of this paper is the fact that the UK is going to be president of the G7 this year, as well as leading yeah. um, COP this year as well. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on how, how the UK acts in both those fora could be a launch pad for Global Britain and how they could seize this opportunity. <laughs> So, did you want to go first? Yep. Um, thank you, um, Jess. I think that, I mean, first of all, there, as you suggest, that there are uh, the huge opportunities uh, uh, for the UK uh, this year. Uh, but, uh, I mean, there, there are opportunities in any year being, you know, being head of the G7, but uh, big, uh, in particular because of the pandemic and, and so much else that is going on after the Trump years and, the, and his rejection of multilateralism and stuff. Uh, I think the fact that the UK is doing this when you've got a new presidency, a multilateralist sitting in the White House, just basically some civility back in the White House, that, that helps. And it means that you can get a, a lot more done. Also, a COP, obviously we've had previous COPs, and, but this could turn out to be the most consequential since Paris, because I think it's fair to say that the, the world's interest sort of collectively in climate change and combating it has only increased in, in, in the last uh, few years. Um, so uh, at the G7 itself, I would think like top of the agenda uh, for, the, you know, for the whole G7, but with the 
the UK leading discussions will be response to the pandemic, um, especially uh, in terms of uh, what can the G7 sort of richer world, uh, so to speak, do to help uh, the poorer countries, all, con all members of the G7 now uh, that Trump has gone are members of the COVAX Alliance, and that's a good start, but there's a lot more uh, to do. I think uh, linked with the pandemic is the importance of uh, global economic uh, recovery and having some more, uh, having coordination, particularly around fiscal policy and actually probably around monetary policy with some of the leading central banks is a, is a good thing. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if one country is you know, fiscally st uh, stimulating and others not, you know, the, the, the risks of leakage and things, so that's always becomes an issue on the international stage. I think it's an opportunity to cooperate. And then um, another thing that I just mentioned that is not really linked to the, it's not linked to the pandemic, but it's just been a growing issue. And again, thinking back to my Home Secretary days, the issue of hostile states, you know, protecting liberal democracy around the yep. world, something that um, that uh, is not just an issue in the usual suspects, you know, China, Russia and places, but even, you know, look what's just happened in the US. Um, and I think the importance of protecting democracy, freedom of speech around the world uh, is uh, as important to Biden as it is to, um, to uh, uh, Prime Minister Johnson. And I think that will be big on the agenda and linked to that also fighting uh, corruption and uh, financial transparency, where the UK has shown a, a lot of leadership in anti-money laundering, financial transparency. And, uh, and I think there's interest in that uh, from other G7 countries as well. Fine, just to fit on COP itself, uh, this could be a really, really consequential COP because, uh, again, you're going to, with the US now properly engaging, it was no secret, you know, Trump was not going to turn up to the original COP and nor was anyone from the US. You know, that's what uh, they pretty much made clear now that the date has uh, changed, which has been uh, uh, you know, a good outcome from a climate change perspective, means you really got a chance to reach a good agreement and with the China commitment to net zero, uh, I think that uh, the, the, the big countries and big blocks around the world, the EU, the UK, uh, China and the US have a real opportunity to lead on this issue now. Paul? Well, first of all, I agree with, I think, everything Sajid's just said. So at a kind of more mundane level, um, make everyone feel welcome, be well organized, um, be a good chair, um, don't try and drive a wedge between the way it's presented in the British newspapers and the way it will be reported in other newspapers. And I say that because actually Whitehall and, frankly, ministers are really poor at this. There's some, even though they kind of know that British newspapers are read elsewhere in the world and kind of reported by ambassadors, they can't, they can't stop themselves. And there's been some of that in the past 10 days, frankly. And just a few groans in newly powerful people. Um, and, you know, just, just don't do it. Um, don't try to lead too much or appear to lead too much. It's a moment for Britain to come across as actually, yes, yeah, responsible citizen. Be swept up in the, in the kind of post-Trump world of, of grown-ups. Um, it's, it's something where actually, unusually, the mise-en-scene is going to, um, going to matter a lot. There'll be lots of photos around the world and, and pictures and so on. Um, it will matter, of course, that there are important elections next year in Germany, in France, and the midterm elections in the United States. And some of the people around the table will already be very focused on, um, on, on, on that. On fiscal monetary, I think actually, I will say something substantive about that. It's, it's hard to know kind of what government policy is or could be at this stage, but the signals that come out of government about the mix of fiscal and monetary are, I would say, um, rather different from what's coming out of Washington, but more importantly, rather different from what just about every top expert in the world would, um, would focus on at the moment, which is rely less on monetary because it's more or less exhausted and somewhat more on, on, on fiscal. And But my point actually is the substantive choice um, may in a G7 setting will matter less than, um, than understanding what our position is and being able to explain it um, in a world where at finance minister level and, and at a prime minister level since the last um, two weeks, 
there are no people who know absolutely what they're doing, which is which is that sometimes that's the case and sometimes it's not, but that will affect the dynamics of the meeting um, quite a lot. But the most main thing, you know, um, want people to go home saying, well, they ran that well. That's not what I expected. That was a really pleasant surprise. Actually, these are people I can do do some business with when it's in our mutual interests. That is not that would not be a widely held view around the moment. And these are these are hard nosed people, all incredibly successful in their own particular countries. We um, <laughs> we are as always getting a rush of really good questions towards the end. Um, there's a one from Amar to Sajid re um, leveling up. The COVID pandemic ended this. Uh, so, well, I'm going to make this a question. Um, has the COVID pandemic ended the small government, low tax, austerity form of conservatism? And I think related to that, if on the levelling up agenda, if things don't start to improve, at what point does that start to become a political problem? Will that crystallise politically this parliament? Or is Paul right that this is a much longer term process? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, our, I mean, first of all, the first part of your question, the, has it ended the sort of small government, low tax, austerity, uh, conservatism? I mean, I, I know what you mean. It's not exactly how I would describe it. But uh, the, the government's response when the pandemic started to say, you know, basically Rishi Sunak, the chancellor, said uh, that he will spend whatever it takes. That was broadly, you know, that was the right reaction in the, you know, the pandemic for all, all countries was you know, pretty much, uh, well, certainly we hadn't seen anything like that in our lifetimes. And uh, in terms of fiscal support, the coordination with the Bank of England on monetary support, that was all the sort of net broadly, that's a necessary action uh, for, in supporting companies, individuals, uh, livelihoods. And, uh, and, and clearly that's led to a huge deficit, almost 20% of GDP. But that is something that's uh, manageable. And uh, does that mean, if what you're getting at is, does that mean that's a long term change that somehow the government will keep running massive deficits and not living, not trying to live within its means? Of course it doesn't. You know, that's, this is what you do in an emergency. This was an emergency. It's not over yet. Uh, one day it will be over with the way the vaccine is going. Hopefully that's a lot sooner rather than later. And at, and at some point, but gradually, ever so gradually, you'd start coming back to a point where you need to be a country that is living within its means, that's managing uh, taxpayers' money uh, well, and, uh, and having lower taxes rather than higher taxes where you can afford that. Uh, in terms of the levelling up part of the question, Ed, that you referred to, is that uh, it, you, the, you clearly, the pandemic uh, has meant that a lot of things that you would have done to start sort of uh, levelling up, as it were, in terms of infrastructure investments and uh, changes in skills and things like that, uh, has uh, not had the priority it would have deserved because rightly the government's been absolutely focused on the public health uh, crisis. Um, that said, uh, I, I think that... Uh, there is uh, there's a lot of work that's been done in the background. There certainly was the Treasury already on infrastructure plans, on transport plans, uh, and uh, and also on skills. Um, and uh, and I think that I need to pick those. But I think those things, the physical capital and human capital side, are going to be absolutely uh, critical. And uh, and I think that a lot of that can be put into into action quickly. It will take time, but there are some things that uh, I think can be done. Uh, in, in the next two or three years as a, and, and show some real results before the next general election. Great. So we've got, we've got just a few minutes left. Two final good questions we're gonna, gonna put together. Um, one is, we haven't spoken about the emotional aspect of being bullish about global Britain. Is there a case to be made that a strong, positive, slightly nationalistic narrative is what the country needs to pull together? And then from Eric Salama, We've seen smaller countries than the UK carve out a niche and a brand. Australia is a plucky country taking on China um, or uh, standing up to bullying from China. Israel is a tech startup. In a non jargony sentence, what should the UK be brand be, be known for? Um, I'll go first to give you two, a little bit of time to, to think. I think it's right emotionally. I think the one thing we can't afford to be against at the moment is global Britain, outward facing, engaging with the world, even as we manage leveling up and even as we manage um, our migration system, um, we have to be seen to be 
outward looking confident. Actually, the, um, the vaccine gives us a huge opportunity here. But then in terms of that sentence, I think we, we need to be the global broker and problem solver. Paul said, good at chairing meetings, bringing things together. We aren't the people who ha ha did better on the vaccine. We're the people who can help the world and those countries who need it more and find it harder on their own to get the, uh, the vaccine. It's a huge opportunity for us having the G7 and COP this year. I think we need to try to find a way in which we can be the convener, the problem solver, the broker, the people who bring things, who bring things together, the people who set out to try and revive the WTO to make G7 coordination work or G20 coordination work better when it comes to reviving the global uh, uh, growth in the next couple of years. The kind of, you know, the, the, um, the brokering nation, the people who can bring others together. That's what I'd like us to be known for. So Sajid and Paul, um, optimistic, um, you know, do we need to be bullish? And what's our sentence? No, okay, um, if, if I can begin, if Paul could that, just, uh, yeah, yes, I mean, look, you should, we, you've got to be optimistic, but you've got to be realistic, but I think there's a lot to be optimistic about, and that, uh, you know, we've talked about much of it uh, today about the UK's role, the role it's playing, the role it can play, um, and, uh, and, and I think there is a role in that optimism for being a bit sort of patriotic uh, about your country and uh, being proud, but patriotic in a way that is not a, it, to exclude uh, anyone else or other people's views, but in a way that you can be proud of, of what's been achieved, but also how uh, the UK, your country is playing a role uh, to try and solve uh, some of the world's uh, biggest, most notchiest, uh, you know, challenging uh, problems. In terms of uh, brand, I, open, welcoming, and a country, uh, a Britain that will play its full role in helping to solve the immense challenges the globe faces. Thank you, Sajid. Paul? That sounds right. Um, the, the, the first thing I would say is, if we're going to talk about global Britain, it's tremendously important not to do it in a nationalistic way for the internal reasons that Sajid has emphasized, but also the external reasons as well. I mean, what the rest of the world will hear will be nationalism rather than kind of openness. So the kind of words matter. It's, it's you all, I think, Ed, you talked, and Jessica says she talked about um, um, hubris. Actually, it's kind of been more bombastic at times rather than hasn't quite been as good as hubris. Um, it's it's don't sound bombastic. The serious people in other capitals um, would be, and there's no need to. There's no need to do, do that. But certainly sound optimistic. The second thing I would say though, the question which I read was about you know shouldn't we kind of have some slogans? I think that regular people are much more focused on results than they are on slogans. And I think, I mean, watching politics for 30 odd years when I was an unelected official, that's what I thought. And sitting on the sidelines over the past year, I think that's what the pandemic has shown. Government regarded as broadly incompetent for a long time, then does really well on the vaccine. And actually the polls, the polls swing. And actually the public, many members of the public are driven by results. Is the government doing, the government of the day, doing a tolerably competent job. Now on that, I think that our state capacity has decayed over the past um, 25 years or so. And I think that if we're to stand up and succeed, we will, um, we will have to take that um, seriously, frankly. And I, I think there is even an unwillingness um, in many quarters to, to kind of confront the reality of that decay over the past quarter of a century, which can be fixed. But it involves, amongst other things, making, um, working in, in Whitehall and other parts of government as an unelected person, rather than like you two guys as kind of famous elected figures. It, it means um, unelected officials, not central bankers, um, having much higher social status again so that they are prepared, so that many more able people really want to do that and spend their life doing that. And I, I think we have decayed in that respect. And it's something that um, 
needs to be fixed, just as our some of our institutions need to be fixed as well. Thank you very much indeed, Paul, and that's an important, slightly sombre note, a very important note. Um, thank you. We've heard from um, three um, senior fellows, research fellows at the at the centre uh, this evening, um, from Paul Tucker, from Sajid Javid, and from Camilla Cambridge. You've heard from, from me and two of my co-authors, Jessica and Sechi, two others, Nyash and Tommaso, have been with us, but have not spoken, but we've all been working on this paper uh, together. So thank you to all of them. Thank you to our discussants. Thank you to everybody who's joined in. I hope you thought this was an interesting beginning of a debate about what global Britain is going to, um, to mean um, as we sort of start to come to terms with post-Brexit, um, post-EU, uh, UK. Thank you to everybody. I'm going to hand back to um, to John to um, to close the um, the evening. I hope that was interesting for you, John. Um, it was extremely interesting, and I just want to say first of all, thanks to all the panelists. I thought that was just terrific, and the paper provides a good um, starting point for the discussion. Thanks to the to Ed and the team uh, that did the research on it. I must confess that the last couple of questions were really intriguing. I'm looking forward to. Britain as a global broker, uh, honest broker, with at the same time an, a, a slightly nationalistic narrative. How those balance against one another is an interesting proposition and one which I think Paul was alluding to in his, uh, in his comments. But I do- I think I you're just, suggesting, John, that the US in the last three or four years didn't do that so well. I would not hold the US at the moment up for the last four years of anything uh, in a positive way, but that's my own personal bias uh, on the topic. So, but I think it's terrific and it's a, I think it's a terrific start to a discussion. And I just wanna say thanks to everybody and thanks to everybody that's participated, but also the people that are listening in. Um, again, a terrific topic, an important topic. Uh, so thank you all and good luck. Uh, and we'll, do it, we'll do it physically when we can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, John. Thank you, Roger.